Hey guys, what's up? I'm Erin and welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another episode of Open Money. In this episode, we are speaking with Will. Will is a school teacher as well as an Airbnb investor. So let's hear what he has to say. I'm Will, I'm 48 years old and I'm from Pacifica, California, which is a suburb of San Francisco. Well, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I've enjoyed watching all of your other guests. I think it's a great idea. I love it. It's been really fun. So I hope people want to keep doing it. <laughs> so do you want to start with breaking down what your finances look like? Assets, liabilities, sure. things like that? Uh, okay. Well, I'm married. So I'll give you my husband's assets too. Okay. I have it all written down <laughs> yep. and I kind of rounded yep. because I Absolutely. saw that you've done that. So yeah. these are kind of rounded numbers. Um, I have 156,000 in my Roth IRA. 444,000 in my 403B. Um, David, my husband, has 186K in his Roth, 160 in his 403B. Um, he has 3K in this, this little random TSA um, account mm -hmm. from this, his, his second job. But I, nothing ever happens with that. So I don't really know what that's about. Eventually, we'll figure out how to roll it over or do something with it. Maybe just go do something um, fun with it at some point. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> sure. Fun is good. Uh, we don't have to save everything. Yeah. Um, he has 148000 in the cash value of his pension. So when he starts withdrawing that in a couple of years, and we can talk about that because big changes might be afoot. Um, you know, I don't know. If we just get that. I, I think that's like, you can either take the pension or the lump sum of that. So that probably will not be liquid cash. Just that will go into what they pay him out mm -hmm. for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. So um, we have 142,000 in an emergency fund. That's kind of too much, I think. But when we start talking about, you know, my properties and stuff, you'll see we just built a cabin with some friends and we sold it. And I think I'm going to owe like, a ton in taxes. So have I'm a cap buffer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's liquid in retirement. And then for our properties, I just did like I take Realtor, Redfin, and Zillow and I average out what they say the property is worth. And then I subtract what we owe on it. So I'm just speaking in terms of equity, mm -hmm. not not what the home is worth. Yeah. So in our home here in California, we have about 981,000, I estimate. Um in equity, we have a vacation home. You know, we only had to put 10% down, but really it's it was a, an investment property. It's mm -hmm. an Airbnb in Tennessee. That's we have 345,000 in equity in that one. Then we have another one in Tennessee um, worth with about 197,000 in equity. And then we just bought a third one. It was the most expensive one because interest rates are not super great right now. Mm -hmm. So Time will tell whether this was a good idea. But anyway, with that cabin that we sold that I just told you about, we yeah. took that and um, we actually bought it from my friend, Lisa, who also was in on the cabin build with me. It's actually her vision. Like she's responsible for a lot of this. So, But anyway, <laughs> there's 96,000 in equity in that. Um, so if you add that up, it's about 2.8 million, 2 million, 858. But I, I don't, I know not everybody does this, but I include, our cars, because okay. those are our biggest asset. We don't have anything in the house that's probably worth very much. Yeah. But, and, you know, so I, I include that. I know some people do in their net worth. So, you know, we have a Honda CRV yeah. <laughs> worth 14,000 based on Kelly Blue Book. Yep. And then my little Honda Fit is worth 23,000 because I bought that right before the pandemic and yeah. then stopped commuting for mm -hmm. a year. So it barely has any miles. So if you add in that, it's, 2.895 million. So close to 2.9. And we've been over 2.9, but you know, the market has the market. Not been very cooperative lately. But <laughs> maybe in future years it'll get a little better, but this year's been yeah. a rough one. <laughs> exactly. And you know, my dad and some people say, like, oh, don't look at that every I mean, I calculate our net worth every single week. I'm a little really? little obsessive about it. yeah. I, thought, I do it a lot and I do it once a month. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I, every Friday night, you know, once the markets close and Saturday yeah. morning, I, it's just, it's one of the many things, including the whole Airbnb stuff. 
yeah. that due to the pandemic and all this time on my hands, yeah. I just created these really, what I think are really beautiful spreadsheets. I love them. They're my little <laughs> project. So I not only, I do that every Saturday or Sunday, yeah. and then also, you know, I write down everything I spend in this and it's all color coded and <laughs> just looks really nice. And it, if you do it every week, it actually ends up going really fast. You have all yeah. your past memorized. And yep. so that's been fun. And I guess what I was trying to say is some people, when the market goes down, they're like, oh, I just can't look at it, you know, but I think, yeah, I mean, I don't like it when the market goes down, but yeah. you get to see what is actually left over and how much you still have and, you know, how much you have to be grateful for, you know, like, okay, the market tanked, but we're still fine, you know? We're, yeah. we're and I think the more you check it, like it kind of eliminates that fear of like watching it go down because if you have enough of an investing time horizon that you've been through, you're used to it. You're like, okay, it's been down before. We've come back. We were at this point, we rose, we'll rise again. Yes. Yeah. I to I remember that from even before the pandemic, there was like a two year period where I was still, still contributing, you know, mm -hmm. maxing everything out. And it just was, it was going up and down. It was just mm -hmm. the markets were just bored or something. They were yeah. doing nothing for like, that was 2016, 2017, and around the time I started my latest teaching job. But yeah. anyway, those, those are the numbers. You can put them on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> now, what do your debts look like? Well, we don't, like I said, I mean, if you add up the mortgage debt, it's a lot for four yeah. properties. But like I said, it's 1.4 million in, in mortgage debt. But um, mm -hmm. I already subtracted that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Gave you the equity. So, yeah. you know, that's it. We When we did the build, I took up money on this house. So we have a HELOC. Mm -hmm. So we had about 30K in debt, but I, you know, we paid that back off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no car loans. And, you know, we're older now. I think, you know, I used to have a little bit of student loan debt. Mm -hmm. My husband did. He was under the eight ball for many years. Mm -hmm. But I'm 48. He's 58. So we're not, you know, we're not millennials or Gen Z. So we've had time to pay that down. Yeah, you know? yeah. so, so in other words, no debt. I say that with a lot of gratitude yeah. and humility. We don't have any debt. Well, Besides the, the mortgage. Million. <laughs> <laughs> Besides that 1.4 million, but yeah. who's counting, right? <laughs> right. But the, the beauty of that in these Airbnbs is that the guests, that's another thing that's fun to keep track of. It's just to see the guests, you know, pretty soon they pay for every capital expenditure that you put into the cabin. Yeah. Like the HVAC and the deck repairs and the new hot tub. They pay for all of that over time. You have to put, put out the money up front, yeah. of course. Um, but now um, it's getting to the point where they're almost paying off the down payment. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow, like once that hits zero, I think we have about $9,000 left of what, the, you know, what we put into the, the first cabin. Yeah. And I mean, that'll be, that could, because the holidays are big time rental, hopefully. I mean, um, you know, the market, it, you know, recession could be, pending and people are worried about gas prices and inflation still. So hopefully it'll continue to rent. But anyway, eventually it'll be as if someone just gave you a cabin, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And it produces income. So you know, now is the goal with the cabins, is that to have those provide you an income in retirement? You know, that it's, it is now, now that I said in two years, um, and I hope I don't lose my train of thought with this, but you know, my husband will retire. He'll start mm -hmm. collecting his pension. Mm -hmm. He may sell the house here and just cash buy in a cheaper area, uh -huh. which is almost any other area in the country. Yeah. <laughs> Anywhere <laughs> outside the Bay Area. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just don't head to New so, York City and you'll be fine. <laughs> right. So I was, yeah, exactly. And I, I joke, I'm like, oh, we should move to Manhattan because that's actually where we met. I'm like let's move back to New York where it all started, but you know then that you're not getting ahead. You're just putting yourself <laughs> further behind to move to Manhattan. Yeah. But anyhow, um, yeah. So the, the cabin of first was just sort of like I could tell you that whole story, but um, it was just sort of a diversification. Like okay, we have our retirement assets. Like let's yeah. and we have this house, which mm -hmm. is awesome. But let's get 
a vacation home. That was my kind of dream for years, Mm -hmm. but I never knew you could do it through. I never thought anything about the short-term rental business Mm -hmm. until my friend Lisa, you know, a couple of years back, she posted like, Hey, look at my cabin, you know, that I just bought in Gatlinburg. And this was pre-pandemic. And I was like, Gatlinburg, like, okay. I was there a long time ago as a kid, Yeah. but, and it was cool. I remember all the shops and restaurants and like the gondolas going by and it was a cool area, but I hadn't thought of it for years, but it turns out that area is just a magnet for short-term rentals. And even when Airbnb and everything came out, they had no problems there because that that ecosystem or that like the culture there, the ethos is like that it's okay to have a cabin and rent it out. And it creates a whole economy there of cleaners and handymen and everything. Yeah. So that was going to be um, one of my questions. Why Tennessee? Was it well, just that it's easier to have an Airbnb there? Well, I mean, it's cheaper than, you know, you might say, well, you live in California. Why don't you buy in Tahoe or, um, you know, Napa or something, but you're talking really expensive properties. Mm -hmm. So, and there are a lot of investors from the West coast who invest in Tennessee, but it's because of that. It, the, just the, the ecosystem and the smoky mountains, they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, here in California, people are like, what, you know, like, cause we have Yosemite and stuff. We have our own mountains. So they don't think about the smoky mountains, but they're very beautiful. They're centrally located. You know, we have guests from Michigan, Florida, all over the place, not too many from the West, but that area just is a magnet for tourism. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it's like accepted part of the culture that you can get a cabin and rent it out. Most of the owners are not from Tennessee, you know, there. So um, yeah, it's, we are, now that I've crunched some of the numbers, we will be It'll be different because right now the income from those cabins, we don't just spend it, we put it away, mm-hmm. you know, preferably to get the next property because everybody mm-hmm. wants to scale up. Mm-hmm. I don't want to scale up to some of these investors, man. They are just balling. Like, oh, like we're closing on 10 properties this month. And I'm like, what? Well, you know, they're all on YouTube, you know, they're doing doing their thing. And some of them are really amazing. But um, we're fine. Like, three properties is good. I'd like to maybe get another one, but anyway, it will be a change in the next couple of years when our income goes way down Mm -hmm. to rely on those cabins for like, you know, everyday income rather than just putting that money away. Yeah. So that was a very long way of answering your question that um, it started out as just wanting, wanting to diversify. Mm -hmm. And now it's turning into, Oh, wow. Like, okay. We actually needed that money, you know? So I'm glad that, I'm very glad that we got into the business and I love it. It's fun, you know, great people. You said your husband's going to retire in about two years, right? That's the idea. Okay. Now, what about you? Um, Well, so I'm approaching 50 pretty quickly here and I, I don't, I'm not ready to retire per se. I would love, I would just call it a slowdown. But, you know, in my 50s, I still want, I teach music at uh-huh. the middle school level and I love it. I love doing music. I love doing choruses. I love working with kids. Um, so if we stay here, you know, I would probably continue my job, my uh-huh. full-time job. If we move, I would like to just hopefully work part-time, I guess. Uh-huh. Um, and just buy myself a little freedom to do some other things that I want to in life that I want to, I want to enjoy it a little bit, but yeah, I mean, for those people out there who are in relationships where there's a pretty big age gap, it, this is a time when it really comes into play. It's like, he's ready to totally retire, like not answer to anybody, but I'm like, okay, I don't know if I can afford to do that. We will see what the numbers look like when we get there. Are you both on the same page financially? Yeah, I mean, oh, absolutely. He, we do our finances very differently, Mm -hmm. uh, I would say. So we both have separate checking accounts, Mm -hmm. uh, separate credit cards, Mm -hmm. and then there's a big savings account in the middle. And it's just expected that, you know, he pays some bills, I pay others. Yeah. But whatever money you have left, it's supposed to go in the pot, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the month. 
that's exactly how we handle things too. <laughs> because maybe your husband isn't as meticulous, you know what I'm saying? So, well, I mean, I just feel like it's a good idea to maintain your independence in a relationship because I mean, I love being married and I think marriage is wonderful, but I don't think it means giving up your freedom to have your own money, you know? Like we very much manage our finances together and we pay the house together. We both pay some of the bills and we take care of that. But like if I wanna have my own money to go buy athletic wear and he wants to have his own money to go buy new headphones, like there's nothing wrong with that. Exactly, Yeah. exactly. I mean, he's a big time fly fisherman. Mm -hmm. That equipment is very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, Fortunately, he has, I feel like he has everything you could possibly own in regards to that sport or that activity. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, if he wants to go get something, mm -hmm. there's no question. If there's something big, like a big ticket item, mm -hmm. I'd say, I don't know, three to 500 bucks or something, then yeah. we'll talk about it. Like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, he wanted this table on the backyard, this beautiful um, mosaic surround I don't know what I don't know what it is but we like <laughs> most people in the in the backyard yeah. and it was a lot of money yeah so we talked about it mm -hmm. and that's the sort of thing um that would come out of the big the big yeah. pot you know what I'm yeah. saying we do the same thing like we just bought a new tv that came out yeah. of the joint you know because it's for the house <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. actually for a couple of years you know how I, I mean literally for like 13, 14 years, maybe longer, I've written down every penny. Yeah. Because um, I think that's what's important. I know people want to budget, but what I tell people is before you budget, you have to know what's coming in and what's going out. So just yeah. at least for three months, write everything down, mm -hmm. what's coming in, don't change anything. And then write everything down that you spend your money on. And that will give you a very clear picture of mm -hmm. how you should budget. Um, so for it, for a couple of years, two years, and this was just on a piece of notebook paper. Yeah. I would ask him like for all his receipts, I would look <laughs> at his credit card. And then I would even like, if he went to the farmer's market or something was going to spend cash, I'd say, mm -hmm. okay, well, how much did you spend? Yeah. Well, and he would turn around and like, oh, about 20 bucks. I'm like, no, no. 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 To the penny, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that went on for a couple of years and I kind of had to stop that and just... <laughs> you know, keep track of my own. So all this stuff that I keep track of, it's really only part of the picture. So mm -hmm. I don't, it's not going to do us totally that much good, but I just, it's part hobby and part, it's a little bit burdensome. Sometimes I don't want to do it, but now mm -hmm. I just don't feel right. If I don't write stuff down, it drives me crazy. Yeah. I kind of, eventually I'll have to, I don't know, go through therapy or something to like, figure out how to let that go. Maybe a little um, intervention here. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and the other thing, and I just was doing this about 20 minutes. I just want to confess, because I know some of your viewers probably do this, but every single morning, um, you know, I get up at five or five 30 and that's when I take care of the cabin business, like yeah. pay a bill or text the cleaners or uh, check in who's, who's coming, who's going, you mm -hmm. know, just to make sure that everything is smooth. And I really enjoy that. And I will file the bills or put it on the spreadsheet or whatever. Yeah. And I have my coffee, you know, sitting there. But the other thing that I do, I go on my credit card. I basically have one credit card for all the miles, mm -hmm. put everything on there. And I add up what I owe, the pending charges. Mm -hmm. And then I subtract what's in my check checkbook. I still keep, you know, old fashioned checkbook, you know, written down. So it's yeah. the checkbook plus the spreadsheet. So it's a little overkill. But like right. I said, I... I just, I, I'm obsessed with it. So I can't, if I don't do it, then I just feel like something's off. But anyway, I subtract what's in my checkbook, mm -hmm. hopefully come up with a negative number, which means I have more here than I have on my credit card. And then I divide that amount by how many days until like the next paycheck. I just wonder if anyone in the comments is, does this, because then you come up with a number, like sometimes it's yeah. pretty high, like, wow, I have 71 bucks to spend. Mm -hmm every day until I get paid or just, I just did it now because I put some money in savings. I only have $35. So I per day yes. for the next 12 days. Interesting. Um, I can it, tell yeah. you, I've never done that, but I hope other people can say that they have. I've never done that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a good way. Cause then it's like a game like, yeah. okay, we're going out for lunch, but 
I'll try really, it forces you to think mm -hmm. about whether you need that extra thing on the menu that you're going to order or when you go to Rite Aid and you're going to gather some items like, okay, maybe I don't need this one right now because I you don't want to go over yep. that amount because it yeah. just, it irks me to go over it. And if I don't go over it, then it's like, um, it's like a small little victory, you yeah. know? Like, Yay, I didn't spend my $35 today. But inevitably, a bill, an expensive bill will come through or yeah. you have to go to Costco and get groceries. Yeah. But you're going to just go way over that sometimes. Yeah. And But it's just a way to try to make it to the next paycheck without, even though I'm not saying we live paycheck to paycheck, but you know, it's just, it's a little bit of a game, but it also yeah. is a little bit of a gauge, like, okay, this is how you are. And sometimes if you're doing really well, like, wow, I have $85 and I don't think there are any more bills coming yeah. through 85 bucks a day. Then you can go, you feel perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. And I think Susie, you know, we, we haven't talked about Susie yet, but yeah. she's always like, on my shoulder, like, do you need that latte? You know, yeah. you know she, so <laughs> But then you feel you know, like yesterday I went and I got an iced coffee and I could have made it at home. I make it, yeah. easier. but I'm like, you know what? I'm out. I'm coming home from the gym. I'm running errands. Mm -hmm. I can afford this. Yes. I have X amount of bucks. <laughs> well, I think so, you bit. saying that you gamify it. I think that's kind of what a lot of like super savers and these people who really just enjoy finances and their spreadsheets and things like that. I think they turn it into a game. And I think that's why it's fun. I think the people who don't like finances and don't want to pay attention to it haven't figured out how to make it fun, so to speak, because inherently a budget itself isn't fun. But it's like if you can find ways to turn it into a game, like how much do I get per day or something like that, it becomes yeah. fun. Yeah. It's all a game. It's a hobby. It's kind yeah. of my, my husband's always saying, you need to get a hobby. I think I got have one. <laughs> do anything. <laughs> but yeah, the, the budget stuff or the record of the spreadsheets and all. Mm -hmm. and again, I always did that like either on a piece of paper or then I graduated to using an app. Yeah. Um, but then during the pandemic, you know, I was just sitting there and um, yeah, I created all these Google spreadsheets that I really, really like. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I guess I do understand because I have so many friends who just don't want to know anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if you just face it and I have family that are that way too, you know, they don't want to think about it. Um, they don't want to deal with it. But I'm like, if you just face it, it's not that intimidating. You actually realize you have enough. You it's kind of like just rip the band-aid off and then right, you right, deal right. with it. You create a plan, but if you just go through it with blinders on, you'll never know. Exactly. Yeah. Face it, people. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So do you have goals so that you would like to discuss as far as your finances are considered? Well, you know, I, I thought that you would ask that, and it was always in my mind, the dollar amount was like, okay you know, 2 million each. So 4 million as a family yep. of two, mm -hmm. no kids, you know, um, just, you know, little dogs uh, and one big dog, actually. Um, so I always thought, okay, if we have 4 million, that'll be enough. But now that this is coming up in the next two years and we're really thinking about mm -hmm. moving like either to Chicago or Portland or whatever it is, it's not so much about the big number. It's just mm -hmm. like the monthly, like, what do we need? We don't actually want to move. We yeah. would love to stay here, mm -hmm. but I think it's a great financial move. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of people do it. They're not leaving California because they hate it. Yeah. They're leaving because it's a smart move. Because then say we don't have this mortgage anymore. Wherever we move, we're still going to owe taxes and insurance to mm -hmm. live in a home, but we won't have the mortgage. Mm -hmm. So we're used to, and again, I say this with a great deal of gratitude and humility, because I know a lot of people don't have this, or, or they might have more, who knows, mm -hmm. but we're used to about an income of about 11000 a month, take mm -hmm. home. That's after contributing to everything. Yeah. Um, and that's to cover any food, bills, mm -hmm. fun, anything. So if you take the mortgage away, this is just the rough numbers I've been crunching lately, then, you know, we're going to need about eight grand mm -hmm. wherever we move. Mm -hmm. um, and his pension after tax, it depends. You know, I, I saw your good friend mm -hmm. that lived in Vancouver. 
Yeah, I was going to say go live in Vancouver because then you don't have income tax and then you can go to Portland as often as you want. And Vancouver, it's like right there. It's 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And we looked, we went up to Portland the other yeah. right before school started. Yeah. Because we have really good friends there too. Mm -hmm. So we stayed with them and it happened that we just flew in on a Sunday morning. So I was like, oh, let's go look at houses. You know, we're not in the market, but yeah. just for fun, there are tons of open houses. Yeah. And there was this one, uh, there were a couple in Vancouver that had ADUs. I really want one with an ADU so that that renter can then just essentially pay for whatever taxes, insurance or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I loved Vancouver. It had that cute downtown. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've been there or visited your friend. Um, it, I, I used to live in Vancouver. That's how my friend and I met. <laughs> oh, okay. That's awesome. I, I want to go back. That's where I want to live. We're currently living in Rhode Island. Um, but my husband being Coast Guard, we're going to continue moving for the next seven years or so. I want to go back to Washington so bad. And I want to be in Vancouver. There you go. Well, maybe we'll see you there. You but neighbors. Did, <laughs> you didn't like it because it was just sleepier, you know, it didn't oh. have that, you know, Portland was just not quite like San Francisco. It definitely felt smaller yes um, but that was awesome too because I was like whoa we just looked at three homes and it took us no time I mean here it takes you forever to get anywhere I mean they um, do have rush hour traffic for sure but I mean if you don't go at peak times you can get to Portland in like 20 minutes honestly so I'm like I would rather live in Vancouver I'd rather not have income tax and if you need something big you go across the river and they don't have sales tax so you can buy a couch or whatever and then you go back home <laughs> It doesn't work for a car though. They're on to the games. Like if you go buy a car in Portland and then go register it in Washington, they'll make you pay a sales tax. Uh, they'll, uh, they'll catch you on that one, but you can buy your furniture there and you're just fine. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, you pay for your car. Yeah. I can't wait for David to see this, but so that he get, that's what I've been telling him. Yes. Like the taxes are better in Washington. <laughs> You won't have that perk in Chicago, um, but I can I think of great places in both Wisconsin and Michigan where he could do fly fishing and he can do that in Oregon too. And Oregon is so beautiful. That's, I mean, it literally, Aaron, it comes down to that. Like, yes. where am I going to fish? Not me. Him. Yeah. Where, where, <laughs> you know, so, and we like the West Coast. Yes. We, just, we love the people. We have connections up there. And it's got, you know, the, the kind of mountains and streams that he would want to be in. We've mm -hmm. talked about, because I have family in Michigan. That's where I'm from originally. Where so are you we, from in Michigan? I'm from Grand Blanc, which is okay. like south of Flint. Oh, I know where it is. I grew up in Boyne City, Michigan. Yeah, yeah. We so were just up there. I, I was there two weeks ago and I used to work at Boyne Mountain and I got married yeah. in Bay Harbor because I worked there and we got a discount on our wedding. <laughs> There you go. There you yeah. go. yeah, northern Michigan. And I love that. it there. Yeah, uh, that's, and that's, okay, so talk about Chicago. Mm -hmm. First of all, you know, I live in California, so you can't scare me with Chicago taxes, you know, like I'm yeah. used to. Um, and people are like, oh, it's so cold. Like, why would you want to move there? And I'm like, you can't scare me with the cold, you, yeah. you know, cold because I'm from Michigan, mm -hmm. you know, but the the price is there. You can get a really nice condo in a cool neighborhood. With that, I mean, if we move to Chicago, first of all, like we could have, we could buy a condo outright and then have enough to maybe try to get a cottage. I know the ones up in Northern Michigan are really expensive if they're on a lake, mm -hmm. but try to get something up there that we could then vacation to or rent out yeah. or a place in Florida. Because the most beautiful thing about Chicago is, I mean, I love the city no matter what. And it's, you know, it's a great trade-off from San Francisco. It's another world-class city with art and culture oh. and, you know, all everything that you could want, but at a fraction of the price. Mm -hmm. So I mean, Chicago is expensive because it's a city, but it's Midwest expensive. It's not like California or New York expensive. <laughs> it's doable. Yeah. I would, uh, that's my top choice, but the answer always is, well, that's not the kind of fishing I want to do. Like, that's what he'll say. You know, so if I talk about David want to be? He wants to be on the West Coast. I mean, okay. ideally, but again, what I'm saying is go to Chicago. The best thing about it is that airport, mm -hmm. and the location. You can get anywhere, whether it's London or, you know, Paris mm -hmm. or Bozeman, Montana, if you want to fish yeah. or Traverse City, if you want to mm -hmm. go up to Northern Michigan or Florida, like there are direct flights everywhere yeah oh so i love the location and my family not my parents and my brother in st louis my sister's in wisconsin so it's just right there 
you know? I think, speaking from personal experience, being on the East Coast and being like in Midwest, you have better travel options. Um, but on the West Coast, I thought my quality of life was better just because I loved the West Coast. I love the scenery. I love the mountains. I love the rivers and the ocean. But your travel options are less because everyone I know, or if I want to go to Europe or something like that, it's so long as far as flights. To get back to Michigan from Portland was the day. You know, it would take between the layovers because there's no direct flights to Northern Michigan. That doesn't exist. <laughs> you have to go through Chicago or Detroit. So I think. If you don't want to travel as much, I vote for the West Coast, unless you want to travel to like Hawaii or something like that, or Alaska. But if you want to travel more, I think Chicago is a better bet. Yeah, absolutely. And you're preaching to the choir because I was just looking at plane tickets last night because no matter what, we go to the Midwest to mm -hmm. see my family and to the East Coast there from Delaware to see mm -hmm. David's family. And we do that twice a year. Mm -hmm. And at Christmas, it's a, you know, a three leg, what, mm -hmm. you know, you have to go three different legs, you know. It's so hard you, to get to the West Coast of the U.S. and back, it is. So it's always expensive, but yeah. it's family. So that's what, you know, there's no, there's no way we wouldn't do it. The only time we didn't do it was during the pandemic, you know. Of course, I get that too. <laughs> we have a lot to figure out in the next couple of years. Yeah. And that'll impact your finances for sure. Absolutely. I know that's why I'm like crunching numbers and wondering about these cabins and everything. So we'll see. So what would be something that you would give people as advice for finances or how do you think about money? Well, number one, what I said earlier is, you know, if you're afraid of the word budget is such a bad word. So just don't do it. Like, Instead of do that, keep track of your finances mm -hmm. and you don't need a budget because you can yeah. see black and white what's happening and where you're spending too much. I, I've had friends that have had all kinds of debt, whether it's student loan, credit card, car. And I'm there's, you know, Susie would have a way or Dave Ramsey would have a, an order. Mm -hmm. You know, you should, it, in, for the most part, it makes sense. You tackle the one with the, yeah. the largest interest rate first. But I always say like, man, before you go after the debt or before you build up an eight month emergency or whatever, like at least build up a small emergency fund. That should be your first thing. It's like a thousand to $3,000 because if so something goes wrong with the car or anything, you're just going back to the credit card mm -hmm. and you're, you'll never feel like you get anywhere. So if you have that 3000 bucks or whatever, something goes wrong and you, you're, you have the cash to cover it, then that also, I know this is a very, Susie thing to say, but it's very empowering. It feels, yeah, it makes yeah. you more powerful to have, um, you have a setback, but then you're able to cover it. Mm -hmm. And then that, that, that like, like psychologically just helps you out. And then once you have that, then go tackle the other debt and then build up the emergency fund or, you know. Absolutely. I think it, it creates independence if you can just take care of yourself and when things come your way, because inevitably something unexpected always comes your way. Exactly. Exactly. Um, what was, uh, I had another advice. Uh, just, I always tell younger people if they ask, you know, cause a lot of people don't want to talk about money, but I do, yeah. but it's just to always think long-term yeah. about every decision you make. Absolutely. That, that really could inform where you live, whether it's Vancouver, Washington, or Indiana or whatever. Um, and who you marry or how many kids you're going to have, if any, mm -hmm. or even how many pets you're going to have, if mm -hmm. any, because those are expensive. So I think sometimes people just don't think, or especially about cars, I'm sure everyone's big about cars who's in yeah. the personal finance because those are such money pits. Yeah. So I guess that's my advice for what it's worth. <laughs> well, I love it. I think it's great advice. And oh, well, one really important thing I wanted to say, and this is a very Susie thing, this you can't compare like mm -hmm. some of your guests who are 26 32 and they are just killing it I'm mm -hmm. like where was I like I started late 20s like finally figuring it out yeah and getting responsible but so more power to them but it does me no good to say oh I wish I would have mm -hmm. been as good as they were when I was that young but 
you know, I'm happy for them. They're doing awesome. And, and I was irresponsible in my twenties. I think that's okay. Well, I always like to say like, I will be anybody's biggest cheerleader, no matter where they are in life. Cause ultimately it just matters that you're heading in a direction that works for you because it doesn't even matter. Say someone in their twenties is looking like they're doing something better than what you did when you were in your twenties, but maybe they're not even going the same direction you are, you know, like it, I think it was the office that had the quote of something like, if you're putting your ladder against the wall, make sure it's, if you're climbing a ladder, you make sure it's leaning against the wall you want to climb or something like that. But there like, you go. everyone's situation is so different. It doesn't matter what anyone else is doing. As long as you're heading where you want to go and you're getting to your destination, that's it. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's kind of like, how I think about money just because it, it, someone in New York doesn't need what someone in Michigan needs to live a quality life. You know, like their buckets have to look very differently based on the living expenses. But if the person in Michigan wants to live in Michigan, if the person in New York city wants to live in New York city, it doesn't matter. Exactly. Yeah. I want to say thank you for doing this. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This has been fun. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing the video when it comes out. <laughs> And yeah, and all your content, keep, keep going because it's really interesting. I'm learning things all the time. I love when people find a way to gamify their finances. I feel like that's the way to make finances fun. And in my book, that makes you a pretty cool financial nerd. And being a financial nerd, I think that's inherently pretty cool, no matter what anyone else has to say. If you would like to be a part of this series and have your finances featured, please just send me an email, erintalksmoney at gmail.com. We can talk about net worth, income, your view on money, you name it, we can talk about it. Just send me an email and we'll get it set up. I post new videos every single week. If you got anything at all out of this one, please give it a like. If you're new here, please consider subscribing or if you know of someone who might get something out of this type of content, please consider sharing. I hope you have a great day. Bye.